Good morning again, Grace Church. This really is a... Oh, we got screens now. Ooh, That's for you, fancy. I got to learn how the art of not knocking that over because I pace a lot. So if I knock it over, we'll just skip over the awkwardness of it. Um, it's a joy truly to be back here worshiping with you. By the way, my wife and kids are probably watching this online. So wherever the camera is, honey, good morning. It's actually, it's afternoon. Good afternoon. It's good afternoon, Nathaniel, Ethan, and Rachel. I'm glad y'all could join us. Um, before I start, let, let me share a little bit with you um, what we've been doing in Nigeria. If you're meeting me for the first time, I used to be a pastor here, and we got called to Nigeria to go do uh, missions. And so um, we are in the city of Jos in Plateau State, Nigeria. We're right in the middle of the country where the Muslim North meets the Christian South. And we are in what I would describe as a, a hotbed of Christian persecution um, in Nigeria, if you type in the word J-O-S, Joss, Nigeria, it'll tell you what's happening. But, man, God has proven himself faithful. In fact, uh, I think uh, the Lord has grown myself and my family incredibly in our faith um, being in Nigeria. And I'm convinced that um, God will often meet us and show up big time on the edges of our faith. Um, as I've discovered in Nigeria. But several things we're doing in Nigeria right now. We are training pastors. Um, we went there to go plant a church, but if you've ever been on a mission trip or been in the mission field, you know things never go according to plan. And really quickly, things changed for us, and we focused on training pastors. This year, we've had the privilege of working with 250 pastors who are serving in persecuted communities uh, where churches have been burned, Christians have been killed, and these pastors are shepherding them. So we host a retreat where we sponsor a retreat where we bring them, we train them how to shepherd a persecuted congregation. How do you walk your congregation through difficult times? And so we've had the privilege of uh, partnering with some ministries to uh, train pastors. Um, I've also uh, taken what Pastor Armin began here at Grace Church called the Timothy Training, where he trains elders how to be an elder, and I've created a version of it for Nigeria. And so this year, we've gathered several pastors where over the course of 12 weeks, we're sitting with them, teaching them, how do you shepherd a church? What does an elder do? How do you deal with church discipline? How do you deal with sin in the life of a pastor? And what's really exciting about this is we started with about eight guys in the spring, and upon graduation, each of them recommends two people who will join me in the fall for another 12 weeks. And our vision is to do this year after year so that in three to five years, man, we have a network of elders and pastors that have been trained. And then uh, this next piece we're really excited about, we are launching a podcast next month called the Nigerian Pastors Podcast. Got impressed on our hearts early that we needed to put something out there that pastors could access. And what's really exciting about this is it's not only in English, but we're actually releasing the podcast in a northern dialect that Muslims speak called Hausa. And recently we hired uh, this young man, Isyaku Mato. He is a godly seminary graduate who speaks Hausa fluently. And so uh, I recorded in English, he records in Hausa, and we release it on um, podcast. At the end of this sermon, we will play a video that's highlighting what we're doing, so you'll get a chance to see that. So. We're focused on pastoral training, but we're also serving widows and orphans. Um, in Joss, there's just a large population of widows and orphans uh, because of a lot of the uh, persecution by Muslim extremists. And so these widows are specifically widows of Christians who have been killed. And we partnered with a ministry called Threads and Lights Sewing Academy. They basically bring these widows to the city. They train them how to sew clothes. And after a year and a half, upon graduation, each widow is giving a new sewing machine and a small loan to start her home business so she become self-sustaining. In the lobby, we have several bags that are hand-sewn by the widows that we're actually selling as a way to raise support for them. So if you stop by the lobby, there's only a few bags, so y'all might need to fight for it. Um, and then last year, we collected toys. Let's go back to the other slide. Last year, we collected toys. You guys generously gave us toys. The toys went to the children of those widows. We hosted a program for them where they earned points, and the kids got many of these kids. This is the first toy they've ever owned, so it was a blessing. Um, and then we also partnered with um, a, a, the same ministry that we work with pastors, um, where we picked a specific community um, of widows who are farmers, whose husbands were farmers, were killed. And we essentially purchased a huge plot of uh, acres of land and purchased bags of seeds, maize and beans that we gave to them so that they as widows work as a co-op to work the farm, grow the farm, whatever they grow is theirs to keep and to sell so they become self-sustaining. 
And then finally, uh, I speak regularly to persecuted orphans. Uh, these orphans specifically experience their parents being violently killed. And so we work closely with Voice of Martyrs. Um, and every year we bring them to a retreat where we really do a father blessing on them. This is probably one of the hardest ministries I've done. Because when speaking to an orphan, the idea of God's love doesn't really stick as easily as it would with someone with a parent. So, but God's been with us. Um, and in the lobby, we have information on the table. You can find out how to support us, how to be a part of what we're doing. But uh, that's what we're doing in Nigeria. So let's jump into the sermon. You pray with me. Mighty God of heaven, um, as, I, as we turn to your word now, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my God. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, uh, King Solomon writes these words. He says, there is a time for everything. Some versions say there is a season for every activity under the sun. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. And, and he goes on to list several different seasons that people, organizations, and churches will most certainly have to go through. And I think one of those verses aptly describes where you as a church find yourselves this morning. Here's what he says. He says in verse four, he says, there's a time to mourn and there's a time to cheer. And then in verse five, he says, there's a time to embrace and then there's a time to part ways. And as a church, you um, have just entered into a season of transition where, for, for some of y'all, you're mourning the transitioning of a beloved pastor and leader, right? Um, and, and some of y'all are perhaps wondering what's going to happen next. Where do we go from here? Who's God going to lead here? What's going to happen in between? What's going to happen to Grace Church? And there's this sense of un, what I describe as not quite being settled. So in today's sermon, we're going to look at an account in the first chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, if you want to go ahead and track that down. And we're going to look at the early disciples in the church who, like you, suddenly found themselves without their team leader. They suddenly find themselves without their shepherd and pastor because... Jesus had ascended to heaven. And from these disciples in Acts chapter 1, you and I are going to learn, or as a church, we're going to learn how does a church move forward in a season of transition? How does a church move forward in that unsettling, in-between seasons where you've just experienced the departure of a beloved pastor, yet you're expecting that God's going to lead someone who's going to lead us into the future? So in that sense, as a church, y'all have a lot in common with the folks in Acts chapter 1. Because remember, Jesus has just ascended to heaven. He's just ascended to heaven. In fact, let me, let me set up Acts 1 for you, right? Because um, prior to Acts chapter 1, Jesus has spent three adventurous years with his disciples, preparing them, teaching them, doing all kinds of incredible kingdom things. But then he's violently snatched away from them. He's crucified, dies, buried, he's buried. But then three days later, he rises from the dead, spends 40 days with them, and ascends to heaven. And so um, his ascension is both a celebration, which we just did for Armin, and mourning, which many of you are experiencing, right? So like us, their leader has gone to heaven. Well, Armin didn't go to heaven, but <laughs> you know what I mean, right? <laughs> right? Like their leader has transitioned. Um, they are expectant because Jesus says to them, he says, if I go to heaven, I'm going to send what? Who? The Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus says at one point, he says, it is better for you that I go to heaven so I could send you the Holy Spirit. So there's a sense where there's something exciting coming. But once again, like you, they, they find themselves in this in-between unsettling season. So when we meet them in Acts chapter 1, they are in a waiting room of sorts, just as you are. Here's what Acts chapter 1, verse 12 to 17 says they did in the in-between season. Then the apostles, after Jesus had ascended to heaven, returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, which is about a Sabbath day walk from the city. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, they went upstairs to the room where they were all staying. 
Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, who, by the way, is also called Nathaniel, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. By the way, Judas Iscariot makes the 12th. And it says all 11 of them joined together constantly in what? In prayer. Along with them were, were, were the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter, who was the lead disciple at this point, stood up among the believers, a group that numbered around 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through King David concerning Judas Iscariot, who served, by the way, as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, in fact, shared in our ministry, but he's dead now. So verse 21, Peter says, therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who has been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was with us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Okay, so um, there are, uh, from their story, there are at least two immediate lessons we could learn from them. We'll get to the main idea in a second, but two immediate lessons I want to emphasize. One is this. They did not disband as a group because Jesus wasn't there. Let me say that again. They did not disband because their leader was gone. And number two, they were not idle even as they waited. They were busy. Uh, in fact, here, here's the big idea we can, if we were to take this passage and sum it up into one central thought, here's the big idea that flows from it, uh, that we can learn about a movement or a ministry or a church in a season of transition, and it's this. We, as a church, move forward in this season by preparing ourselves for the next move of God. Do y'all hear that? The way we move forward through this unsettling, in between, don't know what's coming, we miss what was, the way you move forward is by preparing yourselves for what the Father is about to do next. And oh, it's going to be good. Um, uh, so how do we do that? Well, there's three ways from this story. Uh, there are three activities that the early disciples engaged in that will serve us well to emulate as we prepare for what God's going to do next. I'm going to give them to you up front, and then we'll spend the rest of the morning talking about them. Three things they did. Number one is they, they fellowshiped together. They got con So for us, it means get connected in community. Number two is they prayed. So I'm going to talk about how to wrestle together in prayer. And number three is they served which means uh, it's time to step up and start using your gifts. Right, let's work through each one of them. Uh, uh, the first way you move forward as a church in this season that you're not sure what's coming next is y y it's time to get connected in community. I'm talking about community, this community. It's time to get connected in relationships, in groups. So let's talk about the disciples for a second. Have you ever taken it, have you ever considered how diverse a group the disciples were? I mean, let's just even take the 12 apostles. You ever thought about how diverse this group was? Like most of them, if you look at a profile of each one of them, most of them uh, come from different social and economic backgrounds, and they had diametrically opposing uh, political and philosophical viewpoints. Uh, let, me, let me walk through a few of them. Matthew, the tax collector. So Matthew, the tax collector, is a, he's a big government loyalist. He's a big government loyalist who made a career out of collecting taxes for the Romans, who, by the way, were oppressing his own people. So no, no, no one, this, is, this guy is the most hated version of a Jew. Like he's, the Jews would say he's even worse than the Romans. And Jesus picked him. Um, Simon the Zealot. One of the disciples is the exact opposite of Matthew. So Simon is small government, right? He's fiercely patriotic, terrorist group type person um, who wants to kill and overthrow the Romans because he doesn't like big government. Peter and Andrew are blue collar country boys who fish for a living. 
James and John come from a wealthy family and they had such deep anger issues that Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder. Um, like if you think you have disagreements with other people, these guys have you beat. Right? I mean, you talk about, I don't like that scene. I don't like Biden. Yeah, they had worse disagreements than you did, than you do, right? Yet, because of Christ, they had Christ in common. It, you almost couldn't tell that they had those differing views. They had more in common than they had that separated them. Not only that, furthermore, these disciples, think about it. These disciples are not from Jerusalem. When we meet in the book of Acts, they're in Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Spirit. But they're not from Jerusalem. You know where they're from? They're country boys. They're from Galilee. They're from Bethsaida. So they are out of their element. They're out of their comfort zone. They disagree on a lot of things. Yet in Acts chapter 113, Luke tells us that gathered in the upper room regularly, these men with differing views, these women with differing views met together, did life together. I mean, the picture is that, is that they encouraged one another. They looked after each other's children. They served one another. Oh, they shared meals together. Why? Because of what was coming next. Grace Church, hear me out on this. If you are going to pull through and thrive during this season of transition, and we don't know how long the Lord will take to identify and bring to grace the man whom the family he's chosen to lead this church for however long it takes, if you my brothers and sisters are going to thrive in this season. You are going to need to pull together and do life together. In fact, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 tells us that we are not to neglect meeting together as some people are in the habit of doing. I mean, this could have been written to us in 2021. And listen, I understand there's, a, there's still a pandemic. Everyone has different views on it. And you got to use caution. you got to be wise. But Scripture calls us to not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But it says encourage one another, especially as you see the day coming. You, you know what the day is? It's talking about the return of Christ. And if there's any generation that's ever been closer to the return of Christ, it's us. And Scripture says, listen, the end is coming. And y'all, the way you're going to win the community to Christ is going to be through your fellowship with one another. It's going to be time together. And men, the world is in need of community right now, isn't it? People are isolated. People are lonely. And so, uh, practically speaking, let's talk about a few ways that as a church, y'all can do life together. Number one, um, invite one another to dinner. Once again, you got to use caution. You got to be wise about it. If you need to do a self-home COVID test kit before you invite people to your home, do it. Whatever you need to do. But being isolated is not healthy. We need to do life together. Invite one another to dinner. You meet someone on a Sunday morning in church who says he's been coming for a few weeks. Hey, would you like to get together with our family for dinner? Um, ask a new friend to go on a walk or on a run with you to life together. Um, host a game night at your church and invite a new guest. Right when service is over, you know, I love the African church. When service, you know, here at church, as soon as we say amen, like ten minutes later, church is empty. In Africa, man, like first of all, the services are like ten hours long, right? And after that, people are still hanging. I'm like, it is nine p.m. <laughs> Gotta go home. It's not right. Spend time. Won't rush home. Take a minute. Meet one or two people. As you get to know them, you have something in common. Hey, let's 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 go out. Um, um, have <laughs> have a Bible study together at Buffalo Wild Wings where the spirit of Jesus lives, <laughs> right? If you're not comfortable enough having them in your home, invite them out, mask up, have them take a COVID test at the door, whatever it takes. But here's the point, do life together. And here's why that's important. The way you're going to win the world together in a season of pandemic is them seeing a group of people who love one another, who are doing life together. Folks, that is more attractive now than it's ever been. And the world is desperate for community. Do life together, as the early church did. We move forward in this season of transition by preparing ourselves for what God's about to do next. And one of the first ways we do that is by getting connected in community. And number two way that we prepare ourselves is by wrestling in prayer together. Notice I didn't say just pray together. I said wrestle 
in prayer together. The term wrestling in prayer comes from the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. And in that letter, Paul is writing to a young pastor named Timothy who was, um, who, who, who was he describes Timothy as wrestling in prayer in, for his congregation. So let, let me picture that for you because when you wrestle, there's always something at stake. Right, unless you're play wrestling, but if you're really wrestling, there's always something at stake, right? Um, either your life's at stake, or there's a trophy, or your reputation is at stake, right? And so for this reason, when you're wrestling, you give it what everything, you pour your heart and soul into it. Well, for the early church, what was at stake was the fact that um, they had just become leaderless, so to speak, right? And if you're in that season where things are not quite clear, what is clear is wrestling together in prayer. That means you don't just casually pray off the cuff. But now you devote time, you spend time, you cry out to the Lord on your own together as a big group, as a small group, as a church. You pray together re regularly. In fact, as a, because of this, if you look in verse 14, one of the primary activities that the church was engaged in while they were in this season of waiting was what? Verse 14, they all join together constantly in what? Prayer. In prayer, constantly. Along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. You know, when you think about church history, I look at the world and I look at things that have happened in Africa and Afghanistan and, and look at church history. Forget now. Um, every instance of revival in church history, even biblical history, every instance of revival and spiritual awakening um, is almost always preceded by a time of focused prayer by a small group of believers or by the church at large. I mean, you look at the Pentecostal revivals that happen. You look at the Welsh revivals. You look at some of the revivals that are happening in Asia. And certainly in the scriptures, it's actually three things. I would say there are actually two. I'm sorry, not three, two. There are two events that precede revival, and you need to hear this. The first one is, is um, prayer, right? We just talked about that. But you know what the second one is? Persecution. Persecution. There's often some sort of societal upheaval. It may not be dramatic, but something significant that shakes up the world as you know it, that, that then leads to a crying out to God, which then results to a spiritual awakening. So, um, so the revival is God's part, okay? He's the one who, who decides when, you know, the Holy Spirit's just going to show up massively. That's God's part. Persecution is the world's part. That's what it does. It's going to persecute you. So when it comes, don't let it surprise you. Guess what your part is? It's prayer. Remember, persecution and prayer often precedes revival. Um, the world has done its part in providing us with some persecution and societal upheaval, right? The world's given us uh, uh, extremist groups who are persecuting believers. The world's given us a pandemic that's really shaking us up. So the world has been faithful to do its part. Good for you. They're done. Um, scripture says God will be faithful to do his part, all right? Luke eleven thirteen. Jesus says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So the world has done its part. It's given us some form of persecution or, or societal re, uh, uh, upheaval. God will be faithful to do his part. Guess what your part is? Is it possible? I'm about to give you a guilt trip, so just prepare yourselves. Um, what if the next spiritual awakening in our nation, in our community, Morris County, at Grace Church, what if the next spiritual awakening or revival is simply waiting on you, you, to start coming together in prayer, regularly, wrestling together? What if God isn't holding back and he's simply saying, I'm waiting for you to call on me. I want to move, but I want Grace Church to be a part of it. And the Lord simply saying, when you start meeting together in community and you start calling out to me, oh, I'm going to show up like the day of Pentecost. I'm going to do some things in you, through you, even while you wait for me to lead the man I've chosen. Folks, it's not the time to pull away. It's the time to dig in, to do life together.
and to call upon the name of the Lord. So practically speaking, how, how should you be praying, wrestling together in prayer? Well, a couple of things. One, um, pray together, whether in a small group, uh, on a walk, all right? I'll talk about prayer walk in a second, or as a church together, maybe once, however long, often you want to meet. But pray together for the next senior pastor. Pray for the search team as they're looking for the man whom God's chosen to come lead this church forward. Pray that God would be preparing him and that God would give him the same vision that he's implanting in you even now. Um, Pray that, here's one, I I think we often, we're praying for the new guy, right? Here's another one. Pray that God would prepare you as a church. Pray that God would prepare you as a church to receive and welcome the family, the man that God has chosen. Here's the deal. Ask God to align your expectations of what he's going to be with who he is. Because it is hard, just so you know, it is often difficult to succeed a legacy pastor. Pastor Armin was a legacy pastor. And whether you're aware of it or not, you're probably going to end up expecting this new guy to be Armin. He's not. Get over it. I mean that in the nicest way possible. Don't put on the man or the family God's going to lead here expectations that God hasn't placed in him. And so rather than expecting him to be who Armin was, you want to ask God, Lord, align my heart Align our hearts with whom you're preparing to lead this church forward. So you pray for him. You pray for the church. You pray together that, oh, here's one. Pray that God would strengthen and encourage the staff, the present staff, as they lead y'all through the season. Because once again, whether you intend for it or not, you'll have expectations that they're going to be what once what. And they can't. They have to be them. I've been, as a church, we've been through a season like this. We're another pastor transition, and it's a very difficult period. So, so rather than come on Sunday and be like, I don't like what he's preaching, or I don't like what they're doing, maybe pray for them. Amen. And then here's one. Pray, pray. I, I, this is one of the strategies we did when we lived here. Pray or walk your neighborhood. Pray or walk your neighborhood. I mean, just walk down your street. And, and as you pass by each house, just bless that house. If you know the names of the family members, Lord God, mention them specifically. If you know there's conflict in that home, pray for that specifically. Pray that God would bring healing. Pray that God would bring comfort. And most of all, pray that the Spirit of God would draw them to faith in Christ. And and what you're doing is you're actually preparing, preparing the seeds of what may very well be a spiritual awakening that's coming. You don't sit idly by. You prepare yourselves for the next move of God by intentionally praying, wrestling together in prayer, by doing life together. And lastly, men, the way you're going to pull through the season and thrive is, listen, it is time to step up and serve. You, you got to serve. You got to start using your spiritual gifts. In fact, let's get into it. So uh, if you recall the context of Acts chapter 1, Jesus has ascended to heaven. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, has committed suicide out of guilt. And so 12 disciples are down to what? 11 disciples. Well, they are reading the Bible during this period, and Scripture, biblical prophecy, says that 12th spot needs to be filled. And so Peter stands up and be, be, to fulfill the ap- apostolic mandate. Like, you can't just leave that spot empty because biblical prophecy says you have to fill it. And so after praying together and seeking God's advice through an Old Testament practice called casting lots, they end up selecting a new 12th apostle, a man named Matthias. And one of the criteria for selecting the person who would replace Judas was that this person had to have been actively involved with the ministry of Jesus from the time it began to to his ascension. And, and the person they end up identifying was, was Matthias because he meet those qualifications. Now, what I find most fascinating about the selection of Matthias is the fact that for three years, Matthias had served behind the scenes. He wasn't a big name. He's not one of the 12 giants of the church. He was in the background, just humbly serving, going with the ministry, Yet, the whole time, while he's in the background and no one knows his name, no one knows who he is, God, listen, it is God had in mind that he would, in three years, become an integral part of the foundation of the church. You know what the scripture says about the 12 apostles? It says that in the city of heaven, which we're going to get to someday in the future, um, it says in the city of heaven that um, the names of the 12 apostles 
are written on the foundations of the, of the, of the city of heaven. Um, by the way, the gates of heaven have the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the foundations have the names of the 12 apostles of Jesus. Which means Matthias' name is on that foundation. And for three years, he's just a sideline guy. I mean, this is probably an usher. Yet God had in mind that he would become one of the movers and shakers of the early church. His faithfulness in using his gifts to serve behind the scenes, listen to this, resulted in his destiny. In fact, let me, let me say this more concisely. I hope this is as concise as I can get. The discovery of your destiny, whatever it is God has built you for, shaped you for, some of you are in it, some of you are about to step into it, some of you are not aware of it, the discovery of your destiny, your calling in life, is closely tied to the exercising of your spiritual gifts in the church. I'm going to take 10 seconds and be quiet so you can process that. The discovery of God's will for your life, what he shaped you for, your sweet spot, is closely tied to you using your spiritual gifts in the church, the local church where God has placed you. Why? It's the Holy Spirit who gives you clarity, who gives you focus in marriage and career in whatever it is you're pursuing. It's that same Holy Spirit who empowers you with a gift to serve his church. And so when you start using your spiritual gifts, by the way, you each have one. And listen to me, some of y'all have more than one. Some of you have multiple gifts that's tied to your destiny. And until you, you know, some of y'all have been asking, God, what's your will for my life? What are we to do now? Are we to move? Are we to go to this place, that place? Am I to marry this person? What's your will for my life? And God is saying, it'll become clear when you start using what I've placed in you. So use your gifts. Serve. And listen, I understand busy schedules. I, I get that. But the very thing that you're holding back from is the very thing that will probably usher you to what you're trying to achieve. It is time, church, Jesus Christ, listen to this. Oh, by the way, another guilt trip is coming. Um, um, Jesus Christ did not create you or save you to be a Sunday pew sitter. That's not your destiny. If, you're, if, if, you are, if all you do is come Sunday morning with your family um, and you don't serve in the church, you're doing it wrong. Something broke. <laughs> okay, that made no sense, but you're doing it wrong, right? He designed you to, so, so listen, in this season of transition, um, it is time to start stepping up and, and start using your gifts. And that's how, my friends, um, we're going to, and listen, this is about, remember the disciples, right? This is what they're doing in this season of transition. Fellowship, prayer, serving. So, Grace Church, y'all have some, you have some choices to make. You can, you can right now abandon ship, and look for a church that has more bells and whistles and that has a strong dynamic leader someplace else in town because, you know, it ain't happening right now here. And, you, and while you're there, you can pray that God leads to this church a pastor you like. That's one choice. Or you can be the church. You can, you can roll up your sleeves, rally together, get connected in a small group with other believers for encouragement and spiritual support. You can band together with a group of 10 or more, decide you're going to meet regularly at some point to wrestle together in prayer, and you can begin exercising your spiritual gifts. Keep in mind that while the disciples were doing this, they did this, by the way, for a period of 10 days, right? Jesus raises from, ascends to heaven. After 40 days, he ascends to heaven. For 10 days, the disciples, the scripture says that they were meeting together, doing all these things with disgust. And then the day of Pentecost comes, and the Holy Spirit, when he shows up, they're already prepared. When the Lord leads his man here, you want to be prepared for that. You don't want to put all your expectation on him. The picture is that you, as a church, we want to be running toward Christ at full speed so that when the Lord brings the man he's going to lead, he's simply joining the race. You get that picture? Get connected in community. Wrestle in prayer together. And serve together. And as you do, 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless you and empower your lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. I have to run to the Randolph campus to go preach there, so i got to disappear right now. Um, but it has been a joy and a privilege and a pleasure to be back with y'all. Uh, I'm going to play a video right now as I run out um, of the uh, uh, podcast we're releasing. Just wanted to share with you some of what we're doing, but just want to say a couple of things. We have a table in the lobby. Um, if you're so inclined, we would be greatly blessed by your support. We have a card there that explains how to give, but we'd be greatly blessed. Tim is going to be at the table. You can support that. And also, um, we have bags that were sewn by our widows that are for sale. Um, you can sell those. The prices are there, but that would be a great blessing to our family, your support, and the widows in Nigeria. May God bless you guys. Thank you. Check out this video. Week after week and Sunday after Sunday, pastors pour their lives into the spiritual well-being of their congregations. But who pours into the life of the pastor? Where does a ministry leader go when he is in need of some pastoral encouragement? And who does he talk to when he's wrestling with some biblical and theological questions that he needs to address with his church? We created the Nigerian Pastors Podcast as an online hub of spiritual encouragement for pastors and ministry leaders. Every episode is written and recorded with the intention of encouraging, equipping, and strengthening you as a pastor and ministry leader. We not only talk about how to do ministry, but many of our episodes dive deep into the inner life of the pastor, who you are when no one is looking. We also dig into some difficult theological topics that you will most certainly need to address with your congregation in the near future. Our prayerful goal through this podcast is to stir up in you a greater love for Jesus Christ so that you become an emotionally and spiritually healthy pastor who leads a thriving church or ministry. My name is Shegun Aibusi, and I am a pastor and the director of the Gathering Faith Leadership Network. And I'm excited about this new podcast that we're going to be launching in October this year called the Nigerian Pastors Podcast. In this first season, we're going to release a new episode every Monday morning on our website, www.thegatheringfaithleadership.network. We will also be available on four different streaming platforms on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, and AudioMac. And you can head over there to any one of those platforms right now and subscribe to our channel. Just type in the Nigerian Pastors Podcast. We look forward to the privilege of serving you and breathing a Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-filled passion into your life and ministry.